It's good to be in the house of God with you. Really honored and uh, want to welcome everyone watching online uh, and uh, South Mountain and Fountain Hills. Can we welcome all of them? Great, great, great. Uh, really, let's continue to pray for Pastor Ryan and Amy as they rest and recover. They not only deserve this, but they need it. And uh, for this next season of harvest that's coming. So let's keep praying for them. Okay, amen. Uh, and then also, my family's here with me. I have my beautiful wife. Uh, and I'm uh, really honored uh, that, that she's here. Also want to just acknowledge uh, Memorial Day weekend. Grateful for every person who paid the ultimate price for our freedom. Really grateful. So, <clears throat> All right, we're going to clap a lot today. Uh, if, if, uh, if I didn't connect with you or if you weren't here the last time I was here, I think I preached in February and I was preaching about faith and uh, I talked about our church, my family. Uh, one of the things about our church is uh, we're a multi-site church in and throughout the city of Philadelphia. All of our locations are in Philadelphia. Uh, today, they baptized a bunch of people back home and uh, so God's moving. I do... I do want to just elicit your constant prayers. Uh, our church is, uh, is throughout Philadelphia. Our original location is, uh, and you can look this up online, our original location is near Kensington. Uh, and uh, if you've ever heard anything about Kensington, really it's like the largest open-air drug market on the east. And, I mean, you, can, you literally can drive through Kensington and see people uh, shooting up with like with like stuff in their necks and all over it's it's crazy what goes on uh, in our city and so I would just love it if you just promised once in a while pray for us and a God to use I'd really appreciate that all right so this is my second time here so we're kind of like family so now you have to pray for me you know those family members that you don't like not saying you don't like me I'm just saying you have to pray for those people well you have to pray for me now all right uh, speaking of my family, as I said, my wife is here. We, we you know, we've got a son, Maverick, and uh, and we have an evil dog, Phil, uh, and my wife, Lauren, and then our brand new, beautiful, perfect baby, Jovi, Jovi Marie. And uh, and so, speaking of of Jovi, uh, she's about seven months old, and uh, in the process of my wife being pregnant, uh, we moved, and we moved. Uh, very far from where the hospital and her doctor was. And so in the process of moving, just being a, a husband with foresight, I said, dear love of my life, I know you love your doctor. I know, I know you love this hospital. However, would you consider that if you go into labor, I don't know, say at rush hour during the week, it could take us over an hour to get there. So it's crazy here in the sixth largest city in, in the country, there's other hospitals near where we're moving. And I wasn't being sarcastic. I was just literally saying, would you consider a hospital change? And don't worry about it. Already did the research. Our insurance, it, it can go to this hospital and they have a maternity ward. So like it, we can go there together. And so, of course, my wife is like, no, 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 I love, no, it, won't, it, it won't happen like that. I, I love my doctor. I love the hospital. And I said, okay, not going uh, to say it again. Your choice, I'm just going to drive. And so, you don't want to change, just, just, cause, cause just in case. Nope, don't want to change. Okay. Well, it's 4 o'clock on Thursday in the sixth largest city in the United States, which means for the next two hours, at least, it's gonna be bumper to bumper. Like, like we might as well take the, the, the subway at this point, like the train. And so, can you imagine on, on the L or on the subway and uh, the baby comes out? I don't think so. So I, 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 so I hear, Joey, my water broke, it's time to go. And I'm like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not, I'm going to bite my, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. So she's got her bag packed. I, we're, we run to the car and we start driving and I'm like, okay, hey, j just a reminder, there's a hospital close by. Like, are you feeling it? And she's grabbing my arm, like the death grab. Come on, pregnant ladies, you know what I'm talking about? Like, the baby's coming. It's the second baby. 
Baby's going to come quick. And so I'm like, well, what if we just, just go to the, the, the one close by? No, I love my doctor. You're going to get us there. And I'm like, I understand. Yes, ma'am. I work for you right now. I understand. <laughs> but like, it's red. Like from here, like, all, like we're crossing the whole city. Are you sure? Yes, I love my doctor. Get me there or this, or this it's over. Because if I have this baby in this car and you deliver the baby, that's it for us. Of course, when you're, you're you know, about to have a baby, a lot of pain, you say things you don't mean. I, I'm still here. I endured. So when I realize that we're not going to make it, um, I see a state trooper. And, and maybe bumper to bumper. And so I pull off and I, I say, hey, we're about to have a baby. And his face goes white. Because now he's in charge. Now he has to deliver. So I get a police escort. Come on, somebody. Okay. I get a police escort. And, and so, and my, so, but the way he starts driving, because he's like, I don't want to deliver this baby. This is every man's worst nightmare, you know? And he's like, so he starts driving. And what's funny is like, I, I stop for a second. He starts driving and I take my phone and because I have the wherewithal to think this is going to be a great sermon illustration. And I got to tell my son about this someday, you know? And so my wife is like, what are you doing? I was like, if I'm going to endure this abuse, I'm putting this on my dash and uh, here we are you're I mean I'm a hero basically so that's the end of today God bless you go home now you can take that okay now after everything was done after you know baby came several days later on our way home I said love why didn't we just go to the hospital? And she said, well, I was just like, what were you thinking? She's like, I was just thinking, I'm comfortable with my doctor. I'm comfortable. And like, I was just, I was committed. I'm comfortable. I, I know they're going to take care of me, which is totally fair. You would agree with that, right? Now, but I want to, I want to take that thought and that language. I, this was my thing. I'm comfortable with this. And I just want to translate that to a spiritual principle. For some of us, I'm not saying my wife, but for some of us, we, we think in a way, we, we think in a way that comfort and feelings are our leader. Well, we do. And I'm not saying this situation. I'm just saying we make decisions based on comforts. We make decisions based on convenience. We make decisions, and we think based on how we were raised, what we're told. Some of us are discipled by the television. Some of us literally are thinking it's feeling-based because we get our news from Twitter, and we're discipled by technology instead of the Word of God. And for, for some of us, we're in Christ, we've said a prayer, we've received Jesus, but we still think for our old self. And so what happens when we think for our old self is thinking for our old self contaminates the whole self. You know what the old saints used to call this? They used to call this stinking thinking. You heard that before, right? And it's true, instead of thinking victoriously, we're thinking, oh, it's the end of the world. Instead of thinking that you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, the enemy throws one little curveball at you and you're like, oh, it's over, God hates me. You get in one little fight and your mind, instead of going as a married couple, instead of going, hey, we're going to make it through this, we're going to grow through this, you're like, oh, I, I, we're going to get divorced, it's over. And we do that in all sorts of areas because because how we think determines where we go. You understand that the age old adages that that we we rise to the level of our thinking, right? Our our what am I trying to say? Our the, our our attitude determines our altitude. It's just true. 
And so what I want to help you understand today is I want to help you understand that there might be some incorrect thinking as a believer that needs to be gutted out so that you can truly walk in the victorious, righteous, incredible, abundant life that's promised you. So I want to preach a message today called Think for Your New Self. Not your old self. Because your old self will come and try. But think for your new self. Because if you think for your new self, it means you're going to talk different. It means you're going to walk different. It means in the face of adversity, instead of it stopping you, it will propel you. Now, I don't know about you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to the scriptures, I promise. I don't know about you. But this past week was heavy. Especially as a parent. As a parent, just, it hit different. I mean, I literally drove my son to school on the next day after the, the shooting. And I sat there and I was like, I'm going to wait 10 minutes until the doors close. And then, like, don't make fun of me, but like as a parent, I just kind of like, kind of anxious. I literally sent the school an email and I was like, hey, I just want you to know this is the five areas that we're all vulnerable in. <laughs> and my wife's like, oh, you're so embarrassing. But like, come on, come on, didn't it make, didn't this week kind of just put you on edge? And I had a choice to make. I had a choice, was I going to live in, lead in, function in fear, or live in, lead in, and function in grace? Because honestly, what, what was the fear, what, what does fear, living in fear and anxiousness, what does it produce? It, it, it actually produces fear and anxiousness and stress on everybody else. You know, fear has relatives, right? It be, fear is related to bitterness and envy and rage and stress and anxiousness. No matter what happens, we have a choice. Am I going to think for my old self or am I going to think for my new self? And so when things happen like this week, I've got to tap into the righteousness of Christ. When Jesus was beaten and they put a crown of thorns on his head, there was an exchange. His mind for my mind. Meaning it's possible, believer, for you to have the mind of Christ. It's true. So I want to go to Colossians chapter 3 and Paul's writing. And basically, the, the context of this passage is these people are arguing if Jesus is Lord or not. Like if he's supreme. And another old saint, you know, reference is, is basically this. If Jesus is not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. Remember that one? And, 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 but, but that's like basically what's happening here. And Paul's like, guys, you got to just stop. And, and this is where I want to pick up. Verse 12, and then I'll, I'm going to read verse 12 three times. And then I'll give you some other passages. But the scripture says, so as God's own chosen people. Aren't you grateful to be chosen? That you didn't choose God, he chose you and found you and saved you and drew you here into a very great church in a healthy environment. Who are holy, set apart, sanctified for his purpose and well beloved by God himself. That's us. Jump over to verse 14. Beyond all these things, put on and wrap yourselves in unselfish love, which is the perfect bond of unity. For everything is bound together in agreement when each one seeks the best for others. So let me make a couple statements. Here's the first one. If you're going to think for your new self, you have to let love define you. You have to. Now, this feels rudimentary, honestly. It feels like very just basic. Oh, that's cute. It's Sunday school. Love. Christians are love. God is love. It's true, but sometimes we need a reminder as to what love actually is. Because our world tells us that love is love. But what the heck does that mean? What the world is telling us is love is whatever you want to define it as, and it's whatever you feel, and honestly, it's whatever you want to determine. But that's not what the scriptures tell us. First of all, let, let's go back to the fact that you are so loved by God that while you were wasting away in your sin, God loved you. 
like you are the thief on the cross that in the last minute you're like, hey, would you rescue me so I can go to paradise? And Jesus is like, yes, today. Uh, you were the enslaved Israelites that were longing for slavery instead of freedom. And in God's infinite love and mercy gave you freedom anyway. Right? I mean, you, you are the complaining. Uh, we are, me. We're the complainers, but God gave us a promised land anyway. Right? I mean, like this is the kind of love God has. You can go all through the scriptures. We're, the, we're David, who, the, the adultering sinner, yet God redeems us. I mean, we, we literally, we are in Hosea, we are, the, we are the, the, the prostitute that keeps sitting against the husband, yet God stays and invites us and says, I love you anyway. I go on and on and on. Like, God's love is radical. It's scandalous. We don't deserve it, yet we get it. But for us to receive that love and put on love, we've got to know what love is. And I want you to show me. Sorry, I don't know why that. I want to know who love is. Anyway. <laughs> why did that hit my head? So, so let me define love for you because you, you know what they say. Deion Sanders used to say this. If you look good, uh, then, then you feel good. If you feel good, you play good. But, but the problem is, is a lot of Christians... You don't look very good. I don't mean your outward appearance. You're not clothed in love. And so the world looks at us and they're like, ah, I don't know, man. You call yourself a Christ follower who's supposed to be embodied with love, but you're wearing the wrong shirt size. You don't look right. So, so what is love? What is love? In Matthew 124, this is a, this is a great example. This is when God is calling Joseph to marry Mary. We'll go Christmas on you for a second. When, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. Everybody say commanded. And he took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born and Joseph named him Jesus. Now, Joseph didn't have to obey here in a sense. I mean, God came to Joseph. He's like, hey, I got this radical idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, by my spirit, impregnate this teenager. And, uh, and then you're going to kind of endure a bunch of ridicule. And like, also, she, she's not cheating on you. And, and, you know, she's pregnant. But you're like, good luck, guy. <laughs> like, you know how God does it sometimes. He's like, this is not going to make sense, but will you trust me? <laughs> yeah. And of course, Joseph says yes, and then the Bible says he doesn't have sexual relations with her until after the baby's born, fulfill prof prophecy, virgin, you know, a baby is born to a virgin, right? All this stuff, all these things, it's almost like, okay, well, uh, it, it would be permissible, but it's not beneficial. Why did Joseph choose this? Love. Because he loved God. Why do we choose things that go against our preferences and our pleasures sometimes. Is it wrong to have preference? Is it wrong to experience pleasure? Of course not. In its context, in its container, in its God design. But a lot of times as believers, we may say no to something right now so that we can experience God's yes and God's blessing and God's favor later. But even if we don't get to the place of earthly blessing, the blessing is in the fact that we've been received and we've said yes to God. And that one day we'll kneel before him and he'll say, well done, good and faithful. And so what am I saying? Well, in the Greek, there's really, we've taken the, the, the four original meanings of love, which, which you may know them, but what, what are these four meanings? I mean, you have uh, romance, empathy, friendship, and then unconditional love. And we've taken those four different words for love, and we've kind of combined them down into feelings, into 80s love songs. <laughs> but but we're, we're selling God's incredible design short. You want to know what love is? Love is obedience. Love is trust. Love is okay. You know what love is? It's Jesus Christ in the garden. 100% God, but also 100% man, feeling a whole lot of humanity going, 
I don't want to die like this. And blood dripping and knowing what it's going to be like to get my nails pierced, excuse me, my hands pierced and my body destroyed. But Father, not my will, your will be done. And all of us believer have to get to that same place. When it comes to my ideas, my preferences, my sexuality, my political opinions, my career, God, I feel this way, but not my will. Thy will be done. And when those words are coming out of your mouth, that's when you know you're thinking for your new self. We know 2 John 1, 6, but let's just read it because I, I tell my son this all the time. My son, the other day, he goes, Dad, I love you. We, we were uh, Yesterday, we were flying. And you see all these mountains, son? And he goes, Dad, I love you as big as these mountains. And my response was, if you love me, you will be a first-time listener. <laughs> oh, well, I preach to my kid. I practice. 2 John 1, 6, it says, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Clothe yourself in love. Only way to clothe ourselves in love is to be obedient. Once we're obedient, we look like love and because we're thinking different. And so the same thing I say to my son, God says to you. Yet God does it with a lot more grace, doesn't he? Verse 12. Let's read it again. So as God's own chosen people who are holy, that's you and me, we're set apart. We're not arrogant, we're not prideful, but we are peculiar. We're sanctified for his purpose, well-beloved by God himself. Verse 15, we'll jump to verse 15. Let the peace of Christ, come on somebody, I want some peace in my life. Peace of Christ, which is, I love this, I, I use the Amplified, I rarely use it, but it's just, it's, it's extra, and I like it. The inner calm of the one who walks daily with him. When you walk daily with God, there's an inner calm that is indescribable. It's, that, it's the peace that surpasses all understanding. Let it be the controlling factor in your hearts, which decides and settles questions that arise. Like, hey, Jesus is Lord. To this peace indeed you were called as members in one body of believers and be thankful to God always. So Paul's like, hey, you got you to walk in love. You got to clothe yourself in love. Love is obedience. And then also, guys, if Jesus is Lord, if you're thinking for your new self, well, then peace is going to control you. That, that, that's what we have to do. We got to let love define us, but we have to also let peace control us. Now, that seems like weird language. I don't let anything control me. Nothing. And honestly, that's probably a good response, but we got to look at the, at the original meaning of, of what that word is. Well, what does it mean for peace to control us? Well, the Greek word here means arbitrate or judge. In other words, uh, when there's a doubtful issue to be decided, and your peace might be disturbed, if peace controls you, you can judge whether or not that's from God or if it's not. Where, there, where you maintain your peace, essentially, uh, you are like, this is the best way I can describe it. Hopefully you understand how baseball works if you're a baseball fan. When you're in the batter's box, okay, and you're about to hit, the best hitters are kind of like umpires. And what I mean by that is they've studied their opponent and they understand what, what, what happens when they're about to hit. In other words, they can almost determine the pitch as it's released from the pitcher. Those are the best hitters. I'm in the batter's box, I'm looking, somebody throws it, and almost immediately I can tell this is a curveball. I mean, they, they, just, they just have this keen awareness. And can I tell you, believer, that you actually have been given that kind of authority, that kind of insight, and that kind of ability to see the pitch the enemy is trying to throw against you. 
I know this because, I know this because in Mark, or excuse me, Luke 8, Jesus is delivering a man from demons. And what does Jesus do as he stands before the man and the demons inside the man? He says, what's your name? He tells the demon to identify himself. And friends, as believers, when you see the enemy starting to wind up and you know you're in the batter's box of life and you see the pitch released, you have the authority to say to the what is this pitch? Enemy, what are you throwing at me? Those who are controlled, consumed, uh, those who have the inner peace of walking with God daily, essentially you've put on the belt of truth and you know when lies are on the way. The reason that many believers still think with their old self and stay in places of anxiety, fear, depression, and worry, and anger is because we're not calling out the pitch when it starts. And I'm not saying you're going to be perfect at this. I'm not saying that you're going to get it right every time. But after walking with God for a while, and you just start fighting with your spouse for no reason... Or like it just feels chaotic at work for no reason. Or your kids are acting like like more than usual animals. Or the like or like for this, I'll tell you, I I know, oh I know, I know when the devil's coming. Okay. Our dishwasher broke and air conditioning broke in, in a matter of two weeks' time. That's not happenstance. That's the devil. Because I because trust me. My wife is hot all the time. And, and I know I'm going to hear about this being broke. That's the devil. Okay, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a funny example. But like when stuff begins to come at your way, you have the ability and the authority to say, not today. I see that the enemy is trying to throw me a curveball and I've got to see past this. I've got, to, I've got to see beyond this. So anxiety and fear, you don't belong to me. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Shame and guilt, you don't belong to me. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I rebuke it. I send it back to hell. What is your name, Satan? I, and the thing is, that here's the key. The, the, the coworker or the kid who's causing you the trouble, they're not the devil. It just might be that the enemy is using these individuals to come against you. And so we're smart enough to know we got to think for our new self that I'm making ground. I'm making progress. And of course, anytime I take a step forward, the enemy is going to try to take his ground back. And so what I do is I let peace control me. I can call it out. I, I know peace. I know the presence of God. I know the voice of God. And when something comes against that, I'm deciphering before I'm swinging. If you're anxious right now, anxious about the economy, inflation, the state of our nation, the future of our world, our kids, all of that. If there's angst, fear, if you're depressed, you're you're pinned to the bed because you just feel like you're overwhelmed. How am I going to make it? What am I going to do? All these different things, you're feeling that. Let me give you some steps to overcome that. If you're anxious, it's always a good time to pray. If you're overwhelmed, it's important to get into the presence of God through worship. If you don't want to do, get in the word. Here's the problem. Many believers are stuck on making a decision that already has been written for them. And so we go round and round stressing ourselves out and everybody else. And God's like, hey, I'm not going to speak to you because I already did. It's like, no, you, like, no you're living with them and you shouldn't be. So like, I already, we already talked about this. You're, this, is, this is self-induced stress. Not always like that. If you're confused, it's time to shut off the extra noise. Friends, a break from media can do wonders for the brain. If you're sad, it's time to lean into godly community. Now, when we talk anxiety specifically, and I really felt led to to, to address this today because honestly, I got to get up here and I got to preach to myself. And when the world's collapsing or it feels like it, even as believers, we can feel, oh, so it's okay to acknowledge your feelings. You just have to remember that your feelings must bow at the feet of our creator. And so, 
I want to help you, though. I want to give you some practical steps. Here are seven quick-hitting steps when you're feeling anxious, fearful, overwhelmed, or even depressed. Here's number one. You should write this down. Know yourself and your triggers. Important to know yourself. Important to understand things that trigger you. For instance, if you find yourself overeating or comfort eating, you know something's going on. you got to get to the root of it. If you're not, if you're totally exhausted, when you're exhausted, oftentimes your decision making is affected. Get rest. If you don't have any time for stillness, quiet, or silence, well then there's going to be other noises that are going to get in your ear and you got to guard your gates. What are your gates? Your gates are your eyes, they're your ears, and they're what you put in your body. Guard those gates. Body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. If there's no stillness or quiet or, or incoming of the word of God, well, then you're going to be clouded. Sometimes we got to be, we got to be honest with ourselves. Sometimes we're just not honest with the, with the situation and the circumstance we're in. And, and because we're not honest, we will project something that isn't true. And then we'll end up trying to keep up with everybody else. And honestly, just being honest will help you get a baseline for where you're at so you can move forward. It's okay to be like, you know what, I am sad. I am a little worried. Now deal with it. Don't go tell 36 people. Tell one or two. And I've got a baseline. I'm not, it, it does no good to go, hey, I'm not, I'm good, I'm fine. You're stuffing it. And then what's going to happen is just going to just explode out of you. Know yourself, know your triggers. And honestly, have some hobbies. Hobbies help. You can't over-hobby. Husbands, sometimes we do that. Can't, we can't play golf seven days a week. Just can't do it. We're not allowed. Six days. But. Because honestly, I'm reading this to you because there's been an increase. Barnes & Nobles did this study. Uh, there's been an increase in people subscribing to, to overcoming anxiety and books on it. It's 25-30%. And then after the pandemic, it's through the roof. So people, so at, at least one third of the people in here are dealing with it regularly, which I bet you it's probably more than that. Here's number two, embrace your place. What I mean by this, and I'll try to move quick, is like some of us, there, there is general anxiety disorder, which could be medical, and I, I'm all for seeing doctors and going to counseling and, and psychology and all, all this different stuff, particularly in the Christian realm. But, but a lot of people have what I call comparison anxiety disorder, and they're calling it general anxiety disorder, but it's really just comparison anxiety disorder because we're just not, con just not at peace with what we have. Like, hey, this is who you married. Sorry. For better or for worse, till death do us part. Like, get good at what you got. And stop scrolling and hoping it's going to change. It only changes when you work the soil you're in. This is the church you got, which for you, this is a great church. But even in a great place or with a great spouse, we can quickly fall into the traps of the enemy, which is comparing ourselves to what somebody else has. That's oftentimes just a fantasy when it's online. And what I'm saying is, is embrace your place. This is the career I have. God may call you for a change, but while you're there, work the soil. It's what you got. Here's number three. Accept what you cannot change or control. Look, when something is bad, you should explore all options to change it. Okay, I, no doubt. But, but when you can't change it, then God's trying to change you. It's, it's often when you're at this place where, where you're not in control anymore, it's often the best time for God to do his work and a testimony to come through your life. Sometimes the best testimonies come from a hospital room. Sometimes the best testimonies come from a place of pain. Uh, sometimes the best testimonies come from the place where you're going, okay, God, I've tried everything, and unless you move, that ain't going to work. See, we're quick to take credit 
But we'll give God a quick praise, but then we take credit for all our advances. But sometimes God's like, okay, enough taking credit. I helped you all along the way, but here, now you're at a place where the only place you can go is your knees, and it's kind of where I want you. And when I get you through this, I'm the only one who can get the glory for it. And when you get to the place where you're like, okay, I accept, I cannot change this. That's, and so now God, the only thing that's left to do is give it to you. I will fast and I will pray. It's yours. That's when you're thinking for your new self. And it also might relieve the pressure of fear that's welled up in your body. Here's number four. Know your overarching purpose as sheep, as a believer. See, purpose makes pain more manageable. It does. And at the end of the day, please, friends, if you call yourself a Christian, our purpose is pretty clear. I'm here to make disciples of my household, of my community, of my world, of my job. That, that's what I'm here for. And, and when, when I forget that, when I forget that I, I'm on mission, I'm on purpose, that I might go to a nine-to-five job, or I have a business, or I have a career, but I'm there to be a full-time minister, not just to make money and take up space. When I forget that, that's when I begin to fall into a chasing of a pit that I'll never fill. But when I wake up every day and say, I am on, I know it's not always easy to remember this, but when I wake up every day, I am a missionary and I am full time in the ministry. The thing is, friends, listen, like this is my ministry. I hold a microphone. I'm not great at much else. Might not even be great at this. But the thing is, is some of you have so many giftings. God's placed you in your career. That's your ministry. For some of us, we feel like we're just in a rut because we've lost purpose in our place. Number five, get back on the path. Listen to me, I'll say this quickly. Every location, listen to me. There are some of you that you've gotten off the path. You've stumbled here. You've gotten off the path of your purpose or your journey with God. But can I please remind you, listen to me, God is the God who sits and he waits for the prodigal to come home. And he's not going to hold it against you. Love holds no records of wrongs. Just come home and watch God transform your heart and your mind. Number six, engage the helper. The Holy Spirit is available for you. Call on him. There is a time and a place where you got to stop calling on everybody else and get in your prayer closet, get on your face and say, Holy Spirit, come. And the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus promised, I'm saying the Holy Spirit as a helper to you. Pray in the Spirit. Seek the Lord. Use the Spirit. When you're feeling a sense of overwhelming anxiety, fear, depression, the only thing left to do is call on the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Fear, go. I need your leading. Transform my mind. I want to think with my new self. And then lastly, you've got to find a tribe of sheep. Because here, here's what happens to us when we are overwhelmed, when we're depressed, when we're fearful, whatever it is, here's what we do. What we do is we typically, this is in our natural human propensity of sinfulness. We isolate, but God has called us to insulate. The picture of us being sheep, you understand that when sheep are insulated, when they're together, the wolf can't get them. The shepherd's staff is there to fight off every attack. However, when we're isolated, which many of us do because we get mad or bitter or fearful or any of these different things or you name it, we then isolate and that's exactly when the wolf comes in and takes a bite out of our life. So find your tribe, find your community. Lay that burden down at Jesus' feet and at the feet of your friends. Watch God do a work in your mind. Think for your new self. You getting something out of this so far? Come on, every location. All right, I got I to gotta close, but I, I just I feel like I got just a little bit more time. So as God's own chosen people who are holy, that's us, set apart, sanctified for his purpose, well-loved by God himself. Verse 16, let the spoken word of Christ have its home within you. Dwelling in your heart and mind, permeating every aspect of your being as you teach spiritual things and admonish and train one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your heart. In other words, if you want to think with your new self, we got to let love define us, we got to let peace control us, and then we have to let the word live in us. 
This is why we sing songs. This is why it's so powerful to gather in church. Don't spend the whole summer traveling everywhere and missing the gathering. Or while you're traveling, turn up the music and sing because these songs teach us good theology. These songs cast out the enemy as we declare, all hail King Jesus. It's just the truth. And for some of us, the word is around us. We see it. We hear it, right? But we don't, it, it doesn't, we don't eat it. It doesn't live in us. And here's how I know. It's because a nationwide survey of America's Christian pastors show that a majority of pastors lack a biblical worldview. Just slightly than more than a third possess a biblical worldview. What? Did I just, did I just read that right? Well, almost a little over one third of pa- no wonder the church and other places is struggling so bad. Why churches are full of people who are struggling with the same things that people in culture and the world are struggling with. Now, friends, listen. As pastors and as leaders, of, I, I gotta you you are a hundred percent worldview in this house, or excuse me, Christian worldview in this house, biblical worldview. Woo. But at the end of the day. Uh, we can teach, we can preach, but you got to consume it for yourself. you got to go home and lead your house. Can't do it for you. But it's sad because only four in ten Christians in our nation believe the Bible is the word of God. So that probably means that six in ten are thinking with their old self. And maybe the four in ten at times forget to think with their new self. What is a biblical worldview? Here's what it is. Those views were that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. Do you believe that? The second one is that God is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe and he still rules it today. Do you believe that? Salvation is a gift from God and cannot be earned. Do you believe that? Satan's real. You better believe that. A Christian has a responsibility to share their faith in Christ with other people. Do you believe that? And the Bible is accurate in all its teachings. Do you believe that? That's a good worldview to have. Here's what the world tells us. It says, if it offends me, it's wrong. But on the contrary, the Christians say, well, absolute truth does exist and it can be offensive. And so when you're in the house of God, when you're hearing a scripture, when you feel some sort of way about truth, it means the Holy Spirit is active in your life. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation is guilt and fear, and I throw that off of you today. But conviction, like when you're feeling that good hurt, you're like, oh, that hurts so bad. I got to make some changes in my life. That's the Holy Spirit. Lean into that. A secular worldview says that I'm better than you because of your color, status, or position. But a biblical worldview suggests that I'm better with you because of your color, status, or position. God desires unity. He wants oneness. Guys, the world, our nation, divided. Hate, anger, murder, all of it. Man, the church better look like this beautiful symphony of love and grace and mercy and truth where we stand together arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, saying, we know what love is. We've defined it. We're not bending on the truth. We're standing for it, but we're going to love you to and through the truth. And we're peaceful people. we got peace in our mind. That anxiety begins to fall away when you walk into this house. There's joy in the house of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. You know why? Because we have a biblical worldview. Secular worldview is that my body is my own. A biblical worldview is that my body is a living sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and is given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. It's like this. It's not just my body. It's my mind that's his. It's my career that's his. Come on, somebody. It's my job that's his. Like my kid. So when I, when I, here's the thing. When I drop my kids off at school, I got to be smart, obviously. But at the end of the day, God, he's yours today. 
Like, like this is what I'm trying to help you with. I'm thinking with my new self. Like, my whole life is yours, God. There, there's really no part of me. My, my money is yours. My life and my family, my kids, my marriage, all of it is yours. And honestly, God, it's better in your hands than it is in mine. It's when I release it to you that you pour out your favor, your blessing, and your glory on my life. No matter my preferences, my opinions, or my wants, I'm submitted to all hail King Jesus. Last one is this. A secular worldview would be that if I disagree with you, you're canceled, you're out. But a biblical worldview would be if I disagree with you, I still love you, I still pray for you, I still bless you. Come on, there's a seat for you at the table. Come on, let's find you. You understand what I'm saying? We got to think with our new self. All right, I'm closing. I want to tell you one story, then I'm out of here. Guess the band was like, that. he's got to go. Like, yeah, we got to get out if I don't see you again, it was fun. <laughs> okay, last week at our church, we, we do our annual team conference. We invite all of our volunteers on Saturday to come and we pour into them and we bless them. And It's a great day and I, I was walking around during lunchtime. I don't get to see everybody because we're multi-side and, and I'm, I'm preaching on video. And But this, this table of ga- girls grabbed me and she said, come here, come here, come here. I gotta tell you a story, I gotta tell you a story. And she said, I, I just want you to know that God's word through you in, in this church, it saved my life. I said, oh, amen, you know. She's like, no, 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 I, I got, I, I'm telling you, it saved my life. I was, I was a day away from killing myself, a day away. And she said, she said, I, as a latch of ditch effort, I walked into the church that is in my neighborhood, which is your church, and she said, I went in there with my arms folded. You know those kind of people? Like just, I'm skeptical, I'm not here to get anything. But as I was there, God literally unfolded my spiritual arms. She said, I got, I just, God began to put me on the surgery table and started to work on my heart and on my mind. And, and I just began to feel like, hey, there, there's a future for you. Like, like, like you got babies, you got kids at home, you got a husband at home. Like there's more for your life. Like depression doesn't have to own you. Anxiety doesn't have to rule you. Fear does not have to plague you. Like there's a promise, there's a hope, there's a future. And listen to me today, wherever you are, if you are overwhelmed with anxiety and fear, this is not the end. You have a future. God's plans for you are to prosper you and to give you hope and to use you mightily. And so I pray right now in Jesus' name over you that anxiety would go, that fear would run, that depression would leave, that the peace of God would rule over you and that you would think for your new self in Jesus' name. Come on, you believe that today? Believe that today? Come on, every location you believe that today, God's best, an abundant life, a fruitful life, a clear mind, whole, healed, righteous, purposeful. Not every location. I would love it if you would just bow your head and close your eyes because there's some people at our locations today that you're far from God. You're not where you need to be in your relationship with Jesus. Either you've never invited him to be your savior and your leader, Or it's been a long time you've run. You're far from God. You've been following religion, but not Jesus. And what Jesus is saying today is like, hey, you're the one I want. Come, say yes to me. And if you're here and you're just, you're lost, it's time to come home. If you want to get right with God or begin a journey with God at every location, I want to pray for you. If that's you today, far from God or need to get right with God, would you just wave at me right now? I want to pray for you. Come wave at me, wave at me. I'll wait for you. You said, I'm far from, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. I'm going to find Bibles for you. Anybody else? Come on, wave it at me, wave it at me, wave it at me. Anybody else? Anybody else? He said, I'm far from God. I need to get right with God today. We want to get Bibles in your hands. Anybody else? Oh, wait just another moment. Thank you, Jesus. Life is changing forever. Best decision you'll ever make. Can we pray this prayer? You can pray this prayer on your own, but Jesus, come into my heart and my life and transform me and change me. I believe in you. I, I believe you died and were raised, and I ask that you would raise me to new life in you transform me give me a new mind i want to walk with you and live for you so give me your holy spirit that will empower me to do so in jesus name amen come on amen let's give it up for all those people as i go today 
as I go today, I know there are a lot of people dealing with anxiety, depression, fear, anxiousness. And I just want to pray God's blessing quickly over you. If that's you, just open up your hands, every location. You're saying, I just need, I need a fresh touch from God. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would just infuse like a deluge, just, just rain over them peace that's promised to them. I, I just demand that fear and depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts would go to hell where it belongs in Jesus' name. I pray for wholeness and peace like you promised. Give us victory and power for living. Peace, peace, peace that surpasses all understanding in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet and sing today.